Okay, it is noon, so we can get started. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it is great to see you attending a webinar during Earth Week when there are so many things going on and I'm sure everyone's fatigued, so thank you for joining. This will be a uh, recorded webinar, and so we will make this link available after, uh, after the event is over. And just a reminder to keep your mics muted if you have the ability to unmute them. I'm not sure how it's set up, um, but uh, do use the chat if you'd like to communicate with us. Uh, so, We'll get started here. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick introduction and then I'll hand it off to my colleague, Darissa. Uh, so this webinar is being hosted in partnership with uh, Lake Huron North and Invasive Species Center. And Lake Huron North is a fairly new, we're about almost a year old now, uh, fairly new collaborative of organizations in our region who are working to uh, basically improve water quality uh, through collaboration. And our website will be launching very shortly. So keep your ears open for that. Uh, we work together to protect and improve overall water quality in the St. Mary's River and West North Channel of Lake Huron, as well as to provide information related to this effort, hence the webinar today. And we also um, not just coordinate local actions with organizations such as our municipalities, but we also work with local people to increase engagement and capacity. So we often work with uh, farmers and landowners and we do riparian planting, we have kind of exclusion like fencing that we sometimes put up. We've done um, tree planting with municipalities. We're looking at shoreline restoration this summer. So there's a couple of different things that we've done and are planning to do, and we are open to uh, communicating about any potential future projects with anyone who might be here or listening. We have four members at the moment, as well as a number of collaborators who are not formal members of the collaborative. And if you would like to work with us on any kind of projects, please do reach out. Our contact information is here and uh, maybe during so we can send that out with, um, with the link as well if possible. Um, so you can email us and the link here on the website will be up shortly. So with that, I would like to hand off the webinar to my colleague who will be providing you with a wealth of information about terrestrial invasive species. Thanks, Elaine. Let me just set up my screen here so everybody can see it. Are you able to see that okay? Looks good to me. Thumbs up, perfect. All right. And if you do any, have any questions throughout the presentation, I just ask that you put it into the Q&A box or the chat function, and then we can get to them at the end of the presentation. So thanks again, Elaine, for the introduction and for collaborating on this uh, webinar so that we can bring all of the this knowledge on invasive terrestrial plants to everyone. Uh, my name is Darissa Vincentini, and I am the Community Action Leader at the Invasive Species Centre. Prior to starting this position just last year, I was in and out of contracts as a forest research technician with both the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and the Natural, uh, Natural Resources Canada. I graduated from Ogomi University in 2017 with a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a Certificate in Geomatics. And today I'll be giving you an introduction to invasive terrestrial plants on the shores of Northern Lake Huron. Uh, before I do, I'd like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from Sault Ste. Marie, which is in the Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people, home of Garden River First Nation, Batchewana First Nation, and the Métis Nation. I would like to extend my gratitude for their continuous stewardship of our surrounding land and our water, Miigwech. So the Invasive Species Center's headquarters are in Sault Ste. Marie, and if you're not familiar with us, we are a not-for-profit organization founded in 2011. We connect stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to help prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. 
And although our office is here in Sault Ste. Marie, we have staff members across, spread out across the province and our work takes place in both uh, provincially and national scales. So we're gonna start off with what, what I think is probably a review for some people tuning in today. Um, however, I wanna make sure that everyone's on the same page. So we're gonna start with the question, what is an invasive species? An invasive species is an organism that is introduced outside of its native range and causes harm within its new introduced range. So a non-native species is not inherently considered invasive. It has to negatively impact the ecology, economy, or society within its newly introduced range to be considered invasive. And typically we see it impact all three of these. Some characteristics of an invasive species uh, after being introduced are that they are fast growing and reproduce very quickly, being very prolific. They lack natural predators or competitors that would slow their spread and keep their population in check. Uh, and the target species lacks natural defenses against the invasive from not having co-evolved alongside each other. All of these characteristics contribute to the exponential population growth of invasive species and the severity of their impacts. Now that we know what they are, let's look at where they are. So they're everywhere around the world. Our native species are invasive to other parts of the world and vice versa. Um, but focusing in on in Ontario, we have more invasive species than any other Canadian province or territory. We have 440 invasive plants in southern Ontario. We have 39 known or potentially invasive forest insects, uh, 10 invasive tree diseases, and 180 non-native or invasive species in the Great Lakes. The number of invasive species in Ontario is mostly due to it being a large international trading and travel area, as well as having a high population density, making it particularly vulnerable to invasive species introduction because the local population contributes to the spread once they're introduced by international trade and travel. This graph here depicts the invasion curve of an invasive species once it's introduced. So as the time passes and the invasive population grows, the more it costs to manage that species. So as you can see, the most effective time to act on invasive species is at or before species arrival. That could be a local arrival within your community or all the way up to a high level threat uh, for a new introduction to Canada. The reason for this focus around species arrival also increases the feasibility of that species being successfully managed before it becomes established and widespread. The earlier that we can detect an invader through the power of community science, community awareness, and having just more boots on the ground and eyes trained looking for an invasive species, the quicker that we can act and react to eradicate the species before it has a large impact. Once a species is established, however, the strategy often shifts from eradication to management and containment, since eradication becomes less feasible and too costly. So let's get into some of the plants. Uh, invasive plants can have a wide range of impacts on our environment, society, and economy. Some have more of a local impact, while others can have a larger uh, provincial impact. Some of these include damage to infrastructure, uh, outcompeting native vegetation, deterring pollinators, posing human health risks, uh, they can harbor invasive pathogens, and impact uh, important outdoor spaces. So we're going to go over a couple of examples that highlight some of the species to watch for in your gardens and ditches, along walking trails and in our agricultural lands. Um, it is not by any means an in all encompassing list, uh, as we only have time to go over a couple, but at the end of the presentation I will reference several resources, main one being our website. Um, these are all available to you so that you can go and dig deeper on your own time. So let's start off with garlic mustard. It is an edible herb native to Europe and considered one of Ontario's most aggressive forest invaders and threatens biodiversity. The most identifiable feature is the fresh smell of garlic when you crush the leaves. The youngest plants have the most potent uh, smell, and I'll show you what the young plants look like in the next slide. The first year plants can often be mistaken for native violets as they're low to the ground, and the second year plants have the long bean pods with white flowers and triangular leaves, as you can see in this picture here. Within five to seven years, garlic mustard can enter, establish itself, and become the dominant plant in the forest understory, doubling its population size every four years. 
This plant is allelopathic, which means that it disperses chemicals within the soil that prevents the growth of other plants and grasses. This chemical also deters animals from eating the plant. Garlic mustard has two year life cycle uh, with distinctive identification features. So the first year plant grows in clusters called basal rosettes. And this is the stage where a strong root system is developed and the plant overwinters. Also the stage where that strong garlic smell is uh, found when you crush the leaves. Um, the leaves are dark green and kidney shaped. And then the second year plants are those that have survived the winter and now produce seeds. Um, and these, these plants produce hundreds of seeds in one season. Most invasive plant management will require year after year return to the site to follow up. Um, some plants require revisits twice during the growing season and garlic mustard is one of them. The actual act of managing garlic mustard, however, uh, can be fairly simple. The plant can be uh, hand-pulled, grabbing the plant at soil level and being sure to get the entire S-shaped taproot. You wanna focus your control efforts on these second year plants before they produce seeds to help prevent further seed dispersal. And the best way to start is with the outline populations and working your way inward to the main population. The best time to manage garlic mustard is mid-May to early June, and it is one of the first green plants on the landscape in spring, making it easy to manage nice and early. You don't wanna pull once it has started to produce those seeds though. And the seeds are viable in the soil for up to uh, about five years. Since its introduction, garlic mustard had spread throughout Ontario, um, parts of Quebec, and established populations in Western and Atlantic Canada. So it is largely spread across the landscape, but there are cities that still have little to no garlic mustard populations. Um, the upper right-hand picture shows reports along the northern shores of Lake Huron from Sault Ste. Marie to the other side of Manitoulin Island, just little populations. Um, however, these maps are taken from EdMaps, which is a community science reporting tool. So it doesn't capture all of the garlic mustard on the landscape, only those that have been reported, but it does give you a good idea. Um, and this will be the same for all distribution maps that I use and show today. There are a lot of resources available on our website, including a how to pull garlic mustard guide and a video, as well as a how to host a garlic mustard pull event guide. Um, so check out the species profile on our website to find out more about what you can do and how to do it. Next, we'll talk about Himalayan balsam. Uh, it is an invasive herbaceous plant that was initially introduced to North America as a garden ornamental. And uh, you can see why with such beautiful pink flowers. Um, Himalayan balsam typically grows to one to three meters in height and have soft green or red tinged stems, toothed leaves about five to 23 centimeters long, and the crushed foliage has a strong musty smell, so much different than garlic mustard. <laughs> Uh, the flowers are pink to purple and with a hooded shape, about three to four centimeters tall and two centimeters broad. The flowers have often been compared to as to like an old policeman's helmet, if that helps you remember the shape. Um, the seed capsules will hold up to 16 seeds each, and this plant is part of the impatience family, also known as touch-me-nots, which means that when the seed capsules mature, and dry, they explode when they're touched. So seeds can spread up to five meters from the parent plant or cling on to animals and then spread even further. Himalayan balsam looks like the native spotted jewel weed plant, which is also a touch me not, but has or an orange flower and the leaves are much thinner with no jagged edges. Um, it's also a much smaller plant only growing as tall as about 1.5 meters. Himalayan balsam produces really dense stands, creating monocultures and reducing biodiversity by limiting nutrient and habitat availability and shading out native plants. So this photo here was taken um, at one point, it was at one point a walking trail, um, but it has slowly been taken over by the plant. Um, and this area was also filled with a bunch of bees and I'll tell you why. Himalayan balsam's prolific nectar production draws pollinators away from other native or from other plants and native plants and is a main draw for gardeners wanting to attract more pollinating species, which is why it was brought in as a garden uh, plant. 
However, growing this plant should be avoided as it spreads rapidly and will quickly take over native species, reducing biodiversity. One Himalayan balsam plant can produce over 800 seeds, allowing them, them to spread very quickly, both naturally through wind and animal dispersal and through human interference once the seed pods have dried and explode when touched. Uh, this species can aggressively replace native perennial plants along river banks which over time leads to soil erosion due to their extremely shallow root system. Smaller infestations can easily be controlled by hand pulling since they have that really shallow root system. However, management should only take place if there are no visible seeds. Dist uh, disturbing the seeds can lead to further infestation in the disturbed soil from pulling the plant out. Make sure to pull all plants present as leaving even just one can inhibit your progress for next year's management. As the seeds are not very robust, only, they only last about 18 months in the soil. Management can be completed in as little as two years, as long as proper disposal has occurred and all plants have been removed. You can check out our Himalayan balsam species profile, where you will find all the resources, including our newly produced technical bulletin, which goes over management strategies. It is widely distributed across Canada and can be found in eight provinces as far as um, what's been reported. And there haven't been many, if any, reports of it outside of Elliott Lake and Sault Ste. Marie, but it's still a good one to keep an eye out for and to know not to plant it in your gardens. Um, next, we'll talk about common reed, also known as Phragmites, or I'll probably refer to it the whole time as Phrag. Um, Phrag can grow on land, but does prefer wet ecosystems. It's an invas invasive Phrag, which is very prolific as it has three means of reproducing. So it reproduces through seeds, stolons, and rhizomes. There is a native cousin of Phragmites, though, uh, which makes identification a bit tricky. There's no single characteristic that can be used to identify invasive frag versus native frag, as there are anomalies based on what type of environment it is living in. So for example, if it's a wet versus dry environment or high nutrient versus poor nutrient environment, they vary. Um, thus, you have to look at the whole stand rather than one individual plant to take, or you can take an environmental DNA sample. Generally speaking, however, invasive frag might ease um, has a rough, dull stem, blue-green leaves, as well as a well-attached leaf sheath. Um, they grow in very, very high density, and they can grow up to 15 feet tall, whereas the native Phragmites usually maxes out around seven feet. Phragmites is classified as restricted under the Ontario Invasive Species Act, which means that it is illegal to import, this deposit, release, breed, grow, buy, sell, lease, or trade this plant in Ontario. Frag is very detrimental to the ecosystem because it doesn't just outcompete native plants, but it is also another allelopathic plant. So producing chemicals, inhibiting the growth of other plants. So you rarely see uh, other plant species growing amongst frag stands. Frag is also affecting all species at risk reptiles in Ontario because it often uh, establishes in their overwintering grounds where it can completely change the ecosystem. It grows so thick that turtles have a difficult time moving through the stand and it also shades out the area, which is problematic since reptiles are ectothermic and rely on regulating their body temperature by basking in the sun. On top of the ecological impacts, frag also causes high road maintenance or maintenance costs on roadways and properties as new shoots can actually grow through asphalt causing significant infrastructure damage. Dead stem, stems become a fire hazard since they remain standing uh, once they're dried out and in these thick dense stands. And frag can also become a safety hazard on highways by reducing visibility around corners. So lots of con concerns. Like I mentioned though, there is a native Phragmites species which looks very similar to the invasive variety, which poses a challenge when managing for frags since uh, the native species can be beneficial to our environment. Another challenge is the location of many frag stands interfering with species at risk, 
Um, regardless of the control method used, species at risk and other native wildlife may be disturbed and endangered by management activities. Control activities should be strategically timed to reduce potential harm to wildlife, and other mitigative actions should be taken to minimize adverse ecological impacts. When managing for frag, you want to try and time it to avoid seeds. Um, however, if this is unavoidable, uh, it is possible to bag and then cut the seed head prior to removing the plant. In water, frag is very is easy to manage um, by manual removal of cutting the stem with a raspberry cane cutter, a spade, or loppers. Um, this is referred to as the cut to drown method. Um, caution when managing, though, as the cut stalks become very, very sharp, posing a risk of injury. In terrestrial environments, however, methods differ depending on the substrate, uh, population size, and resource availability. Um, spading is an option in sandy substrates, and cutting is an option to reduce uh, photosynthetic capabilities. Um, and then, of course, there's also chemical control methods as an option as well. The Ontario Invasive Plant Council has produced a brand new best management practice guide that goes in depth on each management method and has details on everything you need to know. So to review all of the management methods and to find identifiable characteristics between native and invasive frag, um, you can visit the frag mites or common reed species profile on our website. It is widely spread across Ontario and its distribution demonstrates that relationship between human movement and invasive species very well. As you can see it establishing uh, along the corridors, such as highways and right of ways, and especially when you're looking at the coast of Lake Huron in the top picture. Next, we'll get into more garden invasives. So English ivy is a good example of a plant that's invasive outdoors um, and can take over natural spaces, but is commonly used as indoor plant in pots, which is okay as long as disposal is done properly. Um, it has deep green waxy leaves that can be lightly or deeply lobed, um, and it has this waxy coating uh, which allows the plant to cling onto surfaces and climb. The dense mats can damage infrastructure, causing tripping hazards, and they also smother and choke out native plants, including saplings, so we lose culturally important tree species. Um, it also can be very toxic if ingested by humans or by animals. Management is similar to many invasive plants, including hand pulling and cutting. Um, you want to cut as much of the vine as possible off of the trees and then pull the above ground vines um, and below ground roots, um, bagging all of the plant materials as, as much as you can. Um, like managing most plants, repeated efforts are needed year after year for effective management, however. Um, and I would just note that this plant can cause rashes as well um, by some people who handle it. So you wanna make sure that you're wearing proper PPE like long sleeves and gloves, even though you should be wearing that no matter which plant you're handling. English ivy is mostly concentrated in and around cities and in nearby woodlots where people are dumping their waste and compost. Um, it is more likely for Northern Ontario uh, for it to be newly introduced into Northern Ontario from that same means. So if you look at at least the reported distribution um, map, we don't see any in our area right now in natural settings. However, it's more likely that we would see that from people dumping their uh, waste from an indoor plant in our cities or in a nearby woodlot or something like that, rather than it being spread naturally through Southern Ontario. There are a few other ground covers that should be avoided uh, when you are thinking about plants to put in your outdoor gardens. Um, the impacts across ground covers are very similar. They quickly escape cultivation and take over an area if not properly contained. Um, they produce dense matting and suppression of the forest floor and that includes like seedlings of big trees. It also includes native flowers and things like that. So, um, both of these photos in this slide were taken at a woodlot in Sault Ste. Marie, and all of this is from people dumping their garden waste in the woodlot. Um, so you can see 
uh, periwinkle in the top left, we have goutweed in the top right, and that bottom picture is all yellow archangel. Um, while a lot of nurseries are working to exclude invasive plants for sale, um, these plants can still be commonly sold at grocery stores and big box store nurseries. It's important to for the community members um, to be informed about the impacts of these plants and make conscientious choices when purchasing plants. Um, so we just like to try and get that word out there because you can find it at the store, so it must be okay, right? Um, the best management practices for each of these ground covers differ, however, so you want to check out the Ontario Invasive Plant Council's website uh, for more information on management techniques if you find this um, in your yard or um, in a woodlot or things like that. Lastly, I want to touch on giant hogweed. Um, hogweed can be or can grow to be about 18 feet tall. Um, as you can see in the right hand photo of the plant towering over the gentleman standing there. <laughs> uh, it has very jagged and spiked leaves that look aggressive and scary. Um, it produces large upside down, upside down umbrella shaped flowers. Um, or flower heads, sorry, that grow up to three feet wide and the, with tiny clusters of white flowers. Um, or white to off white. They're kind of cream colored sometimes. Um, the stem has this like purple color to it. Um, and it's also covered with hairs that trap the sap of the plant. And I'll touch on why that's problematic in a second. Um, the most obvious threat of giant hogweed is from that sap that I was just talking about. <laughs> the sap of this plant is phototoxic, which means that it can cause severe burns on human skin um, after it's been exposed to sunlight. So if you get you rub up against the plant and you get some sap on you, um, once that skin that had the sap on, even after it's been washed off, is exposed to sun sunlight, that's when you get severe burns, like boils, everything. Um, and the area exposed to the sap can sometimes remain photosensitive for many years after exposure as well. Um, forage fields in agriculture are susceptible, susceptible susceptible to this invader, which can also cause issues for grazing animals or pets um, on the farm. Sap in the eyes of these animals can also cause blindness, so that's problematic. Um, if you find it on your yard or in fields, it's also very costly to damage because of the liability issues. Um, aside from the obvious issues with giant hogweed, it spreads rapidly out competing native vegetation for sunlight. It increases uh, soil erosion along stream banks, which leads to siltation of water bodies, which can impact fish populations. So there's a lot of reasons why we don't want giant hogweed on the landscape. There are a couple lookalike species. Um, their closest lookalike being cow parsnip, which is actually native to North America. They are both members of the carrot family, and they both have that phototoxic chemical in their sap. However, cow parsnip is much less potent. Um, cow parsnip also has jagged leaves, but they're not nearly as spiky um, and they don't, it doesn't quite reach as high. Um, it caps out at about 2.5 meters as opposed to the three to five meters of giant hogweed. Um, giant hogweed also looks considerably scarier if you were to actually see the plant side by side like I said, giant hogweed has those like spiky, real spiky, aggressive looking leaves and they're very, very tall. Um, whereas cow parsnip, it looks scary when you see it by yourself until you see giant hogweed. Uh, both of these pictures of cow parsnip um, in, are from, from a woodlot, the same woodlot as the ground cover photos I was showing you in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, there was also a large population on Whitefish Island However, someone has been successfully managing it very well. Another lookalike is Queen Anne's Lace with the white umbrella flowers and deeply dissected leaves. Um, it is thought that it resembles Queen Anne's Lace and this is the reason that it was introduced as a garden ornamental. And then another lookalike is called wild parsnip instead of cow parsnip and wild parsnip uh, for years was actually in cultivation and we 
we eat it. Um, however, outside of cultivation, it is more of a concern, um, at least to the public. It can grow to heights up to about a uh, half to one and a half meters tall. It has uh, small yellow flowers growing in clusters. Um, and it's more prevalent in Eastern Ontario right now. We don't really see it over here, but I just wanted to touch on it as a lookalike and also a similar name as well. And this one is invasive. It's back to giant hogweed. Um, it has spread across Canada with populations recorded in Atlantic Canada, Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia. It often invades along roadsides and in ditches on riverbanks, fields, and open woodlands. And giant hogweed has scattered has a scattered distribution across southern and central Ontario, south of the line from Manitoulin Island to Ottawa, if you were to draw a line between those. So south of that line is where you find the most concentration. Um, and confirmed reports of giant hogweed have been made as far north as Kapuski scene. And once again, I'm gonna keep driving this point home. If you want to find out more about this species, visit the species profile on our website to gather more information and find best management practices and fact sheets on giant hogweed. Okay, so we talked about what we're looking for and now what can you do? Um, your garden can have an impact on the community and biodiversity, so we want to make it a positive one by planting native varieties. Step one, there are many native alternatives to commonly used non-native garden plants. So this is a great resource, the Gromian Stead Guide by the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, which will help you determine which native species to use as alternatives to those invasive, commonly used invasives. Step two, you can make a positive impact by disposing of garden waste properly as improper disposal of garden waste can lead to an infestation and spread of invasive species. The picture on the left hand side shows Himalayan balsam creeping outside of a compost and on the right uh, it's the right it's popping out of a pile of garden waste disposed of in a bush. Same woodlot as those pictures actually. Um, to properly dispose of garden waste you want to make sure you always wear gloves, place all plant parts in construction grade garbage bags, and then place them on a hard surface like a deck, driveway, or trailer, and set it in the sunlight for at least one week. This allows the sun to bake the plants and completely kill them before disposing of them in the landfill. Some general ways to reduce pathways of spread. Uh, you wanna clean your boots, clothes, outdoor gears, and even your pets of hitchhiking plant seeds after going for a walk or a hike especially when you're traveling. You wanna buy burn, and burn local firewood to avoid spreading insects and pathogens that are hiding under the bark and inside the wood that we often don't see. And when possible, you wanna choose native plants in your garden. Not only will they be low maintenance because they can survive our climate, um, but they also contribute greatly to pollinators, birds, and other members of the ecosystem. And you don't want to transport plants or soil over long distances, uh, similarly to firewood. Um, and to drive home that point uh, of how easy it is to spread some invasives this way, um, I'll give you an example of Japanese knotweed. Um, you only need one centimeter, a one centimeter long piece of Japanese knotweed root uh, for it to actually start a new plant and then subsequently a new infestation. Um, that's all you need. So it's quite scary and that's how easy some of these invasive species can actually just flourish and spread from one place to another. Um, I know we didn't talk about Japanese knotweed in this webinar, but you can check out the resources on our website to learn more. And you can also send me an email if you are interested in more information. And although not relevant to this talk on terrestrial invasives, in case there are some crossover enthusiasts and we are always looking out for our water, um, Water body pathways are also very important. You wanna make sure to not dump your bait in or near a water body, buy locally sourced bait and clean drain and dry your boat when transporting it over land. You can certainly report any species that you think might be invasive. There are several tools for reporting. We like to encourage reporting through EdMaps and those are all of the uh, maps that I showed you today. Um, this is the early detection and distributing 
distribution mapping system. You can report by either downloading the app or by visiting the website. And these reports go directly to experts in the field who verify that an identification was made correctly. Um, to, so you wanna make sure that you take a picture and include it with your report. And you don't have to know that it actually is what you think it is because we have experts to do that for you. These reports are very important as they help us make the uh, some early detections with more eyes on the ground making reports such as community members, not just limited to the number of folks that are working in the field. Um, they also allow us to map distribution of invasive species across geographical boundaries, giving us the best holistic understanding. And the more reports that we get, the more accurate it is. It helps with selecting sites for management and outreach. Um, so that wood lot that I was talking about, you know, we've made reports in there and that also helps people. If you wanna learn how to identify plants, sometimes we'll do a walkthrough workshop there um, so that you can actually see it and touch it and things like that. Uh, it increases local knowledge of distribution. It helps understand movement of invasive species over time. Um, it can even uh, have the potential to influence policy. And it also enacts a response plan for high priority species. There are other ways to report a sighting um, of an invasive species through calling the invading species hotline or the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. You can also use um, other reporting tools such as iNaturalist. There are plenty of ways you just wanna report where you can and where you feel comfortable. Another way we encourage community members to take action is through our community science tree check form uh, created in partnership with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. This form allows community members to assess and report the health of their backyard or neighborhood trees and look for the signs and symptoms of the presence of an invasive pest without having any background knowledge in forestry or invasive species. We even teamed up with Scouts Canada to help pilot the project where they implemented the form into their summer programming. And it was really great to see all of the reports come in from scouters across Canada. In the form, we outlined 10 common signs and symptoms that may indicate the presence of an invasive pest. And all of these can be visit visually assessed without any measurement tools, field guides, poking or prodding. And again, without background experience or knowledge in forestry and invasive species. So it's really available for anyone. This form allows community members to truly play an important role in making early detections in high risk areas and to prevent further spread of invasive species into our forests. So if you wanna get involved, check out our website. And also on our website, you will be able to sign up for a quarterly newsletter or buy weekly media and event scan, um, learn about stewardship opportunities and upcoming webinars, such as this one, um, can learn about research and in invasive species and much, much more. Uh, we also have a new community science program webpage for you to check out. So this, our website, since I don't think I've said it yet, is www.invasivespeciescenter.ca. That's where you'll find all of these. And lastly, you can also look to our YouTube channel to find past webinars that you may have missed, like our 2022 Invasive Species Forum this past February, or videos such as our how-to series. Um, so a very valuable resource as well. And with that, I wanna say thank you again for listening to me talk your ear off, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Teresa, we have a question from David, and I do want to just quickly say thank you so much for that, providing all that information for everyone. That's been awesome. And uh, I, I personally, and I know someone else in the chat, would love to hear more about the garden varieties as well, because there's so many out there and so many questions about them. Uh, but David would like to know, are you aware of any successful community-based efforts for gar uh, garlic mustard poles that have removed it from an area over five plus years? Yeah, um, actually, so through our early detection and rapid response network, I think it was the first year, so it was prior to when I was involved with the Invasive Species Center, but uh, they did a lot of their work in Thunder Bay and through their kind of first scouting event as they were being introduced to the area and um, talking with the folks on the ground and different organizations that are located there, 
they identified that there was one park in Thunder Bay and it was the only known population of garlic mustard in that area. Um, so now it's been, I think, four years of year after year management. And for the first two, um, the Invasive Species Center was involved and helped train people on the ground and they went year, they went back year to year. And now even after we moved out of the area and to new areas and we're focusing on uh, different communities, those organizations took over the role and have gone back and the population has significantly, significantly decreased. It's only year four, so they have one more <laughs> year to go and they're just seeing a couple plants pop up here and there, but that's that's it. So it definitely has shown um, it has worked in the past. And there's also a population at Sutton Park in Sault Ste. Marie that I know has been a, um, a collective community effort to continue to go back each year. Aside from COVID year, we weren't able to host a garlic mustard pulse. So um, we're hoping to get back and it might mean we're a year or two behind, but we'll get back in there <laughs> and hopefully see that population gone. I feel like the whole world is a year or two behind at this point, but yeah. um, <laughs> so I don't see any other questions right now, either in the chat or the Q&A, um, but I have a question. Okay. So with changing climates and, and shifting ranges for species and things like that and different conditions now for growing that we've seen maybe 20, 30 years ago, I've, I've seen a lot of people getting concerned about whether some of our native species are technically invasive and whether or not it's advisable to plant them. And this comes from, in my neighborhood, uh, the township planted, I don't even know if they're native or invasive red mice. <laughs> near near a water body here and so we're like oh we're not sure if that's a good idea we don't even know what it is and you know so um a few people have asked me a few questions and I'm like I'll get back to you on that so uh, <laughs> yeah are, are there number one species that are native that maybe are not advisable and um also are there changes to growing conditions that have now resulted in formerly okay species no longer being okay to use in various applications yeah so for I'll kind of split it up into two. So there are native species that may not be advisable. They are native, so they still contribute at least to some, in some way, shape or form to our ecosystems, whether that's providing food for pollinators or our local, you know, ecosystem and communities. Um, however, they can be very aggressive and typically those are called nuisance species. Um, and I'm not sure if there's a, a list I can't think of a list to point to to find what if you know which ones are kind of classified under that but um yeah those i would refer to as nuisance species so they're not invasive although they show character they share characteristics to invasive species but they're native and that's the big distinction there um there are also non-native species that have been almost naturalized or here for a long time and haven't posed those um, those threats to the ecology or ecology or economy or society and things like that, um, that with the shifting in climate or opening of niches due to, you know, uh, maybe a different species becoming endangered or just different moving parts to this whole thing, um, those we refer to as sleeper species. So they've been here for a long time and they've been, we've considered them naturalized. Um, however, now with the changing of climate or environment, they've found a way to become prolific and now they're becoming more aggressive and invasive. Um, so yes, not just invasive species have these um, characteristics. We do see them in some native species as we change the environment or as climate changes and um, they're just, they're dealt with differently. <laughs> And Phragmites, I have heard even the native variety has become more aggressive lately. There have been a couple of comments from Deborah. I don't see a question from her, but I do see comments about um, being involved in rewriting Toronto's lawn bylaw. Uh, refusing to include commercially available species in their list of prohibited species, though they did include two noxious natives, um, in quotes, noxious, and then also the 
New York State lists cut plant incorrectly as invasive. Um, not sure if there's anything there that you'd like to spend upon in terms of common practice today, but I don't actually see a question other than that. So just highlighting those comments. Yeah, and the way that minis like municipalities, each municipality will deal with invasive species differently because it really depends on their internal, internal capacity, resource availability, what is actually a nuisance or in their area and things like that and how they talk about that with the public. Each municipality is different, so I can't really comment on how Toronto is doing uh, their, how they're dealing with it, but yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Just want to make sure the people who are watching recordings can actually participate in or understand the chat since they can't see it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't see any further comments. Maybe we'll just give it a moment in case anyone has any other thoughts they'd like to share. Yeah. A quick question. Do you know any good resources where people could go to us? Like, I know there's no such thing, but the one resource you can go to to get all the information, <laughs> you know, as far as uh, garden varieties go, just for people, because it is that season now. Yeah, there is not a comprehensive list of do's and don'ts and what's and who's or anything like that. I think every organization tries to do as much as they can, but there's a lot out there. <laughs> um, so if it is one that we tackle, you will find a species profile and then any resource that is related to that species will be under that profile. So like I mentioned, like all those best management practices, fact sheets, technical bulletins, research is under there, all sorts of things. Um, the Ontario Invasive Plant Council is another great website to visit. Um, they do more with specifically plants. So they have extra resources that we don't um, and it have expanded into the, more of the garden realm. Um, but in terms of a one-stop shop all, I don't know of any resource. <laughs> and again, it's different because every region is different. Um, you know, there's invasive, more invasives in Southern Ontario than there is in Northern Ontario. And it's just, it changes no matter where you go. So finding one list is, it is difficult. The biggest thing though is I would say, even if you have species that you're not sure about in your garden, aside from the, the big ones, um, the biggest thing is just best practices in like disposal, garden waste management and stuff like that. Like don't dump your garden waste in the nearby woodlot, um, you know, things like that. And brushing off your boots before you go and hike a nearby trail, just, those ways that we can limit pathways of spread without even knowing what we're trying to spread um, is the best thing that we can do. Another comment from Deborah. New England has a list of 100 prohibited species, uh, many garden varieties. Ontario has a similar wash list. And Ontario does have like under the Invasive Species Act, um, there is a list of restricted and prohibited species. So you definitely want to make sure that you are um, at least cross-referencing that list at the very least. Okay, and I feel like you've sort of done this already, but if you wanted to have like a main takeaway for people to <laughs> remember, what would it be? <laughs> yeah, uh, the biggest takeaway is kind of recognizing the signs of, you know, you don't even have to know what plants are invasive, but recognizing the signs of an invasive plant, and then you can do the research after, and then limiting the spread of invasive species is easy without having that background knowledge of specific plants. So all those things I talked about, like planting native species, not moving soil or plants long distances, um, brushing off your boots and combing your pets after you travel and go hiking, all of those things um, 
And then getting familiar with how to report invasive species if you do find them, because that is very, very helpful, like I said, with early detections of new introductions, but also for those distribution maps that I was able to show and share and, um, and that helps inform policy and uh, we use it for outreach tools and things like that. So it's very helpful and it is for the most part fairly easy. And if you have any questions with the process, you can certainly reach out to me as well. Excellent. And uh, we will we be providing emails and such uh, in that link recording we'll send out? I think Zoom automatically sends out the recording. I could be wrong, but if not, I will make sure to um, send it to you, Elaine, with, um, well, I guess I will send it out with all of the uh, resources and links to resources as well. Sounds good. And I'm just putting my email in the chat. There we go. In case anyone wants to reach out, if they have trouble contacting or connecting for any resources they'd like, um, I'm also available to help make that connection too. Excellent. Okay. Any final questions or comments from anyone? Deb says thanks for a great uh, presentation. Thank you very much for listening, Deb. <laughs>